Hello class, this is Fire Service Hydraulics and Water Supply, Chapter 14, Relay Pumping. After completing this lecture, the student shall be able to identify the components of a relay operation, discuss the factors that influence the relay operation, and describe the methods used for establishing a relay operation. We're going to cover a few learning objectives in this chapter. I'm going to read them off to you and then we'll get started with objective one. After we complete this lesson, you will be able to describe the conditions that necessitate relay pumping operations. Objective two will recall the types of apparatus and equipment used for relay pumping operations. Objective 3 will explain the operational concepts and requirements of relay pumping. And Objective 4 will explain the process for performing day pumping, relay pumping operations. And now we're going to start with learning Objective 1, which is to describe the conditions that necessitate relay pumping operations. When the attack pumper cannot be connected directly to a reliable water supply source, firefighters have three options. One, they can use the available water in the apparatus water tanks to mount an attack or protect exposures and then allow the fire building to burn if the fire cannot be extinguished. Two, they can assemble and operate a water shuttle operation or three, assemble and operate a relay pumping operation. Where water supply sources are a considerable distance from the fire scene, the best option may be to assemble and operate a water shuttle operation. Water shuttle operations should be used where relay pumping is not practical. Water shuttle operations can involve or do involve the use of water tankers or tenders to shuttle water between water supply sources and the incident scene. These are commonly used in situations where the water supply source is more than one mile from the incident area or the incident scene and may be used when departments do not have sufficient hose to establish a relay pumping operation. For a relay operation, this involves use of a pumper at a water supply source to pump water under pressure through one or more hose lines to the next pumper in line. Pumper boosts the pressure to supply the next pumper until water reaches the fire ground apparatus. This helps to establish a constant flow of water between the water supply source and the incident scene. Now there are a couple of types of relay. One is stationary relay pumping operation. This presents fewer hazards than tankers traveling back and forth on the roadways. It is more fuel efficient than operating a water shuttle operation as well. Review question. List three options that firefighters have when the attack pumper cannot be directly connected to a reliable water supply source. That will be on page 431 of your manual. Learning objective two. In this uh, section, we will recall the different types of apparatus and equipment used for relay pumping operations. A successful relay pumping operation requires various types of apparatus, hose, and equipment, and we're going to discuss those. NFPA standard 1901 requires standard fire department pumpers to carry at least 800 feet or 240 meters of 2.5 inch or 65 millimeter or larger supply hose. Jurisdictions that commonly perform relay operations may carry more than this minimum. Pumpers with 2,000 or more feet or 600 or more meters of a large diameter hose are common. Any type of apparatus equipped with a sufficient fire pump can be placed into a relay pumping operation if sufficient pumpers are not available. 
In an industrial fire protection situation, relay pumping operations are commonly used with there being tractor trailer, or excuse me, trailer mounted fire pumps, such as what you see in the picture here. In the relay, you have different pumpers. The first is your source or supply pumper. That's connected to the water supply at the beginning of the relay operation. And the next vehicle or vehicles are the relay pumpers or inline pumpers. You have may, may have one or more. These are connected within the relay between the attack pumper that's at the fire scene and then the source pumper which is at the water supply. And then of course you have the attack pumper which is on scene itself. You see an illustration of that here on the diagram that's on this slide. Now your source pumper or supply pumper um, may be getting water from a fire hydrant or a static water supply source. That source pumper then pumps water to the next apparatus in line like we saw in the diagram on the previous slide. Now, the relay pumper or the inline pumper that we saw on that slide, those are there to help boost the pressure and then supply that water to the next relay pumper or the attack pumper. So you can have one or more relay pumpers. And in the diagram we saw two slides ago, you had two relay pumpers or inline pumpers. Then your attack pumper receives water from the relay and supplies attack lines and fire stream appliances as needed for fire suppression at the scene. Hose tenders may or may not look like a standard pumper and may or may not be equipped with a fire pump. They usually carry a mile or more of large diameter, which is 4 inch or 100 millimeters, or larger hose. They carry a wide arrangement of water supply equipment and their use is not limited to jurisdictions without water supply systems. They can be maintained as contingency plan in the event that something disrupts a main water supply system. Both medium and large diameter supply hose may be used for relay pumping operations. And you see example of these hose apparatus in the slides here. Medium diameter hose is a hose line that's two and a half to three inch or 65 to 77 millimeter in measurement. Relay operations generally require that two or three of these hose lines are laid. Large diameter hose is three and a half to 12 inches 90 to 300 millimeters. They also come in three and a half, four and five inch, which is 90, 100, 125 millimeters. And those three measurements are the most common. You can have six inch or 155 millimeter and larger supply hose, but that's typically limited to industrial fire brigade operations. The advantages of using a single LDH over MDH hose lines, large diameter, medium diameter hose lines. The advantage of using a single large diameter hose is that there is less hose to pick up after the incident. You also have reduced friction loss and the capacity to move naturally increased volumes of water because you've got larger diameter hose. Your relay relief valve is the most crucial safety device for relay pumping operations. It reduces the possibility of damage to the pump and discharge hose lines if the valves are closed too quickly or by other significant rises in intake pressure. There are two basic kinds of intake pressure relief valves. One is supplied by the pump manufacturer and is an integral part of the pump intake manifold. The second type is an add-on device 
and that is screwed onto the pump intake connection. Intake pressure relief valves are preset to allow predetermined amounts of pressure into the fire pump. At a minimum, these valves should be set within 10 psi or 70 kilopascals of the static pressure of the water system supplying the pumper or 10 psi or 70 kilopascals above the discharge pressure of the previous pumper in the relay. Most add-on intake pressure relief valves will have a manual shutoff and a bleeder valve. You see an example of that add-on intake pressure relief valve in the picture here. Relays that are dependent upon later arriving mutual aid companies can set up an initial relay of lesser volume and greater spacing with an inline relay, relay valves placed in the relay line for incoming pumpers. Now you see an example of that on the diagram. You have your attack unit, which is at the house that's on fire. And then you see at the other end, your intake pumper that's drawing water from a static source, which is the lake and they laid out line in anticipation of relay pumpers coming. So they're using a little bit lesser volume of water, obviously, but what they did was set up these relay valves so that when the pumper relay units arrive, they will attach up to these relay valves and then boost the pressure back up. You see an example of those valves on the right hand side of this slide. These are inline relay valves. If the relay is using large diameter hose lines to support more than one attack pumper, the discharge manifold may be used to break down the large diameter hose into two or more hose lines, then connect to attack pumpers. And you see an example of that in the diagram here. You have the um, at the scene, you have two attack pumpers. At the opposite end, you see the source pumper and it's hooked to a hydrant. Then that's connected in line to a relay pumper and they're using a large diameter hose. And because they need two attack engines fed between the relay pumper and the attack pumpers, you see a manifold which has been attached to large diameter hose and then feeding to smaller diameter hose lines so that they can give uh, a dual attack on the structure that's on fire. A typical large diameter hose manifold is shown here in this picture. And then we see the illustration brought to life um, where in the right hand side of the slide, you see the uh, source pumper using really large diameter hose and you see the manifold hooked up to it and you see the openings for smaller diameter hose lines to be attached. If the relay is using multiple medium diameter lines, each line may support a different attack pumper at the scene. And you can see that here where you've got your source pumper hooked to the hydrant and it's using two, in this case, medium diameter hose lines. Those are fed into the relay pumper and that has two medium diameter hose lines coming from that and one feeds one attack pumper and the other line is feeding a second attack pumper. Some review questions. First, how much hose does NFPA standard 1901 require standard fire pumpers to carry? That's on page 433 of your text. Next question, list the three kinds of pumpers needed to perform a successful relay operation. 
That is on page 434 of your text. Learning Objective 3, we will explain the operational concepts and requirements of relay pumping. Relay pumping design must always be predicated on two basic requirements. First, the amount of water needed at the emergency scene, and secondly, the distance between the emergency scene and the water source. If the flow through the hose lay drops below the required level, obviously the flow will need to be increased. And there are four options to do this. The first option is to increase the size of the hose in the relay. Option two is to add one or more additional hose lines in the relay. This is more practical than replacing hose line that is too small. The third option is to increase pump discharge pressure of the pumpers that are operating in the relay. And option four is to increase the number of pumpers in the relay. Option one is to increase the size of the hose in the relay. And we're talking about increasing flow through the relay if the pressure has dropped below an acceptable level. So the first option to increase the flow is to increase the size of the hose. Now this is more theoretical than practical um, because ultimately it would be impractical to shut down an existing relay to replace the hose being used with a larger hose unless the relay was anticipated to be in operation for an extended time. It is important that driver operators always lay the largest hose available at the beginning of the operation so you don't find yourself facing this possibility because it is highly impractical. In terms of options, this is highly impractical. It would work, but uh, think about the fact that you're shutting down water uh, at the attack scene and it might be at that crucial moment where you're about to turn the tide and, and ultimately save the structure. Option two for increasing flow through the relay is to add one or more additional hose lines in the relay. And, and this is more practical than replacing hose line that's too small. Hose tenders are not committed to pumping additional lay hose line between relay pumpers. Each pumper may have this additional hose line attached to its pump and may begin flowing the hose when all the pumpers are ready. If the position of the apparatus and the hose make laying the second hose line along the route of the original relay hose impractical, establishing a second relay pumping operation to another water supply source may be necessary. Option three is to increase the pump discharge pressure of the pumpers operating in the relay. This does not have a significant amount of practical application. Option three minimizes the number of pumpers needed in the relay, but would not necessarily increase the volume of water throughout the relay. If the pump operates at a pressure higher than 150 PSI or 1050 kilopascals, the pumper's volume capability decreases proportionally. Eventually, it will reach a point where increasing the pressure will not increase the volume. So this is another option, and like option one is, looks good on paper, but in reality presents a lot of technical difficulties. So it is an option if you've run out of all others, but it's not the most practical option. Some other issues with option three are that it increases the pump discharge pressure of the pumpers operating the relay, and this does not have a significant amount of practical application. And then when increasing the pressure, it is that you are also limited by the pressure to which the fire hose in use is rated and annually tested. At no time should a relay pumping operation result in discharge pressures 
that exceed maximum operating pressure for hose that's being used. That will cause damage and get people hurt or killed. So this is table 4.1 and this is, we were just talking about uh, exceeding um, test limits. Since we're on that subject, this is table 14.1 that is the annual service test and maximum operating pressures for fire hose manufactured prior to 1987. So this chart exists because there is fire hose out there that is in use that is that age and when it's tested uh, these are the parameters. If you continue with option three Fire departments may specify and purchase hose designed for higher pressures than the NFPA minimums, and this is particularly true of departments that frequently use large diameter hose for long relays to supply department connections on fixed suppression systems and or portable master stream devices. If that is the case, hose pumping pressure should not exceed 90% of the annual service test pressure. Option four for increasing the flow through the relay is to increase the number of pumpers in the relay. By shortening the length of hose that each pumper has to supply, maximum pressures and maximum flows may be maintained throughout the hose assembly. The downside to this possibility is that if the inline relay valves were not placed in the hose lay from the outset, like we saw in that diagram earlier, it would be necessary to shut down the relay when additional pumpers, one or more, were added. If it becomes necessary to add a pumper to the relay, the following procedures should be used. Step one, position the pumper at the appropriate location in the relay. Step two, remove one section of hose from the pumper for each intake and discharge that will be connected. Step three, connect the sections of hose to the intake or intakes and discharge or discharges that will be used and place the other ends by the relay hose connection that will be broken. And this is an example of where the relay is going to be added and there's not um, a hookup valve. So they're going to have to open the coupling and they've set up the hose connected to the discharge and a hose that will be connected to the pumper intake. Step four of this process <clears throat> is to notify the other pumpers in the relay or the water supply officer to shut down pumping operations. Step five, put the pump in gear and ready for pumping. Step six, once the relay hose is shut down, break the hose connection and connect the relay hoses to the hose attached to the pumper. Step seven, notify the other pumpers in the relay or the water supply officer to resume pumping operations. Where low flow rates are required and large diameter hose is available, the required spacing between the pumpers may exceed the amount of hose carried on each pumper. It may be necessary to call other pumpers to lay hose, but not actually participate in the pumping process. If an inline relay valve is not available, one or more of the extra pumpers may be inserted into the relay without engaging their pumps unless the extra pressure is needed. There are two basic designs for relay pumping operations. You have the maximum distance relay method, which is the more common of the two, and the second being constant pressure relay method. 
Fire departments that perform relay pumping operations together should predetermine the type of relay pumping operation that it will use. Pre-incident dispatch procedures may be established for providing relay pumping capabilities at an emergency scene. When a relay is necessary, the incident commander notifies the dispatch center to respond a relay task force or strike team. The dispatch center then dispatches from three to five pumpers. Either the incident commander or the responding water supply officer will determine the water supply source and the relay route. The maximum distance relay method involves predetermining the volume of water to be flowed by relay. The spacing pumpers appropriately for the maximum distance, they can pump that amount of water through the planned hose lay. Jurisdictions that always lay the same hose for relay pumping operations should make a chart that lists the various intervals of water flow correlated to the maximum distances between pumpers in the relay. And this is a table that's from your book. This is 14 TAC 3A and this is the maximum water flow distance per pumper. So down the left side it shows the flow in gallons per minute and across the top hose available in inches. This is the same table but with metric Departments choosing to develop their own chart should factor considerations for friction loss, residual pressure, the rated test pressure of the hose, and the relationship between the pump discharge pressure and volume, and also consider discharge pressures that are more than 150 PSI. This is table 14 TAC 4A, which is the required pump sizes to achieve the flows in table 14 TAC 3. It's pretty self-explanatory. It gives you desired flow and the minimum pump size you need to get that flow. Same table, but uh, this time the values are in metric. Still working on the maximum distance relay method, you must determine the number of pumpers needed to relay a given amount of water. This is equation 14 TAC 1. This is from your book. You'll see it there in chapter 14. And it is the relay distance divided by the distance from table 14 TAC 3 plus 1 and that gives you the total number of pumpers needed. The one that is added to the relay distance represents the attack pumper that's being supplied at the end of the relay. And this assumes that the attack pumper will be receiving adequate residual pressure to supply the attack lines needed to control the incident. So here's an example using the equation if and this is for again for distance relay method to maximize distance relay if a single line of three inch hose is used how many pumpers will be needed to supply 1000 gallons per minute to a fire scene that is 1200 feet from the water source so here's our formula again relay distance divided by the distance from the table that is 14 TAC 3A, okay, plus 1 is the total number of pumpers needed. So let's plug in our figures. We have 1,200 divided by 225 plus 1. That equals 5.3 plus 1, which is 6.3. You round up, so you get 7 pumpers needed. That's very straightforward. This is the same example 
but this time in metric. So the example is, if a single line of 77 millimeter hose is used, how many pumpers will be needed to supply 4,000 liters per minute to a fire scene that is 400 meters away from the water source? It's the same formula again, but you're going to be using table 14 TAC 3B, which is in metric. So you have your relay distance divided by the distance from table 14 TAC 3B plus one equals your total number of pumpers needed. So if you take 400 meters divided by 225, which is your distance from 14 TAC 3B, plus one that equals 5.8 plus one, which is 6.8, or in this case, again, seven pumpers needed. So this um, slide is just an example of your fire and your water source. This is um, the distance um, and flow rate that were given in the previous example. And this shows you um, how you figured out that you need these additional seven pumpers that are at the top. It's just an illustration of what we just worked out on paper. Tying up to seven pumpers to provide a thousand gallons per minute or 4,000 liters per minute to a fire that is only 1,200 feet away is impractical, however. So it worked out on paper, but really it's impractical. Think about all those pumpers in a relatively short distance. So a better solution would be to lay a parallel hose line or use a larger diameter hose. So um, using US customary or imperial measurements, we're gonna do an example here, which is if a dual lines of three inch hose are used, how many pumpers will be needed to supply 1,000 gallons per minute to a fire scene that is 1,200 feet from the water source? So we take our formula again, and we take the relay distance divided by the distance from table 14 TAC 3A plus one is the total number of pumpers needed. So if we take Again, 1,200 divided by 225, which is our distance from 14.3 or 14 TAC 3A, plus 1 equals 1.33 plus 1 equals 2.33 or 3 pumpers needed. So for metric, we're going to use dual lines again. So if dual lines of 77 millimeter hose are used, how many pumpers will be needed to supply 4,000 liters per minute to a fire scene that is 400 meters from the water source? So if we take our relay distance divided by distance from table 14 TAC 3B, which is the one in metric, plus one, and that gives you our total number of pumpers needed. So if we take 400 divided by 225, relay distance divided by the distance from the table, plus one equals 1.38 plus one, which is 2.38 or three pumpers needed. So you can see that metric or English, when you're running dual lines of larger diameter hose, you're down to three pumpers needed, which is much more reasonable than bringing in seven pumpers. In a real life setting, a relay pumper would assume a position closer to the middle of the hose lay and would be able to supply 1,000 gallons per minute or 4,000 liters per minute to the attack pumper without having to pump at maximum discharge pressure. So here's an example of that. If you have a five inch hose that's used, how many pumpers will be needed to supply 1,000 gallons per minute to a fire scene that is 1,200 feet from the water source? So you take your relay distance divided by your distance from table 14 TAC 3A plus one gives you a total number of pumpers needed. So if you take uh, 1200 divided by 25, 2050, 2050, which is your distance on table 14 TAC 3A plus one equals 0 0.59 plus one, which equals 
1.59, of course you can round that up, it gives you two pumpers needed. Here's a similar example in metric. If a 125 millimeter hose is used, how many pumpers will be needed to supply 4,000 liters per minute to a fire scene that is 400 meters from the water source? So same formula again, relay distance divided by the distance from table 14 TAC 3B plus one equals your total number of pumpers needed. So we plug in our values, 400 meters divided by 590 meters, which is the distance from table 14 TAC 3B plus one equals 0 0.68 plus one, which when you do all the math is 1.68 rounded up, gives you two pumpers needed. You're always gonna round up, obviously, because if you need more than one, you can't have one 0.68 pumpers, so you're always gonna round up, and it comes out to 1.20 pumpers. Well, you obviously need more than one, so you're always gonna round up in this case. So it is possible to establish a maximum distance relay even if all the pumpers are not equipped with the same size hose. Something important to remember. The constant pressure relay method establishes maximum flow available from particular relay setup by using constant pressure in the system. Each pumper in the relay lays out the same type and length of hose. And this method depends on a consistent flow being provided on the fire ground. This method has several advantages over the maximum distance relay, which is what we were doing earlier. This method speeds relay activation. It requires no calculations on the emergency scene, which saves time. It minimizes radio traffic and confusion among pump operators, which also, of course, saves time and confusion on the fire ground. The attack pumper and driver operator can govern fire lines with much greater ease, and operators in the relay only have to guide and adjust pressure to one constant figure. The following step-by-step -step method may be used to form a constant pressure relay operation. So step one involves the incident commander sizing up the incident and then determining the volume of water flow needed. Step two, position a pumper at the water supply source and then make the necessary connection. Step three, lay out hose between su the supply and the attack pumper according to departmental procedures and make those connections to the relay pumpers. This is table 14 TAC 5A, which is the constant pressure relay available flows for various hose lays. So it works like the other relay tables, but in this case, this is for the constant pressure relay. And it's very straightforward. You got your hose lay on the left and the flow available for that hose lay on the right. This is the same thing, but in metric. One important thing to note, make sure to always leave at least two sections of hose in reserve in the hose bed if there's a hose failure that occurs during operation. You always wanna make sure you got plenty of supply on hand. Now, step four of the constant pressure relay method means that the driver operator for each pumper except the supply pumper opens an unused discharge gate if the pump does not have a delay relief valve. Step five means the pumper operator at the water supply source throttles up the engine until the pumper discharge pressure reaches 175 PSI or 1225 kilopascals. Step six, the driver operator at the first relay pumper closes the unused discharge gate once a steady stream of water flows from it then advances the throttle until that pumper is discharging at 175 PSI or 1225 kilopascals. Step seven, each driver operator should set the pressure regulating device on his or her pumper according to the policies established by that department. 
Step 8. The pump operator at the attack pumper must then adjust the discharge pressure or pressures for the attack line or lines so that the appropriate nozzle pressures are achieved. Step 9. The pump operator on the attack pumper should then see a constant flow that is maintained during temporary shutdowns of hose lines by using one or more discharge gates as a waste or dump line. Step 10. Lay additional hose lines between the apparatus in the relay if additional water supplies are needed on the fire ground. When a constant pressure relay is in operation, the pump operators should keep correcting their pump discharge pressure to 175 psi or 1225 kilopascals until one of the following conditions occurs. First, the intake pressure from a pressurized water supply source may drop 20 psi or 140 kilopascals or lower. If the intake pressure drops below 20 psi or 140 kilopascals, there's a danger that the pump will begin to cavitate. Second, operating the throttle does not result in an increase in RPMs. Let's talk about cavitation. Cavitation can be recognized by the fact that increasing the engine RPM does not result in an increase in discharge pressure. This is giving you a signal that the relay's maximum capacity has been reached. The results of cavitation can be pump damage and or disruption of flow of water to the fire ground. Now, a constant pressure of a constant pressure figure of 175 psi or 1225 kilopascals can be modified in some cases, and that may require a different pressure, which include includes variations in relay pumper spacing, severe elevation differences between the source and fire, also increases in needed fire flow and large diameter hose. When increasing the relay pressure, you want to first adjust the pressure at the supply pumper until the desired level is reached. Then adjust each successive pumper similarly. When decreasing the relay pressure, the attack pumper throttles down by opening the dump line to relieve excessive water or excess water. The water supply officer or incident commander must be aware of flow and pressure limitations of a given relay setup and then should not attempt to exceed the capabilities of apparatus and hose. Review questions. First, what two pieces of information are critical to know before beginning a relay pumping operation? That will be on page 439 of the text. Next question, describe two options that can be used to increase the relay's flow should it drop below the required level. That is pages 440 through 442 of the text. Next questions. Uh, first, what does the 1 represent in the maximum distance relay equation that is used to calculate the number of pumpers needed to relay a given amount of water? That is on page 446 of your text. And then list the steps used to form a constant pressure relay operation. That is page 449 through 451 of the manual. Learning objective four, we will explain the processes for performing relay pumping operations. General guidelines for relay operations. Driver operators should follow basic guidelines for establishing a relay, maintaining pumping operations, and shutting it down in a safe and organized fashion. The relay's maximum capacity will be determined by the capacity of its smallest pump and smallest hose line. This is when establishing a relay operation. If all pumpers are to be placed in a relay and have sufficient pumping capacity to meet the demands of the relay, 
the order in which the pumpers are placed into relay makes little difference. The largest capacity pumper should be used at the water supply source because the source pumper will have to develop a higher net pump discharge pressure than the other pumpers in the relay. The higher net pump discharge pressure is necessary because relay pumpers will have a residual pressure at their intake to reduce the amount of pressure needed from the pump. The source pumper begins the operation by connecting to the water supply source. Static water supply means that the pumper will have to use a hard intake hose. If it's a fire hydrant, the pumper should make as many connections to the hydrant as possible. You see an example of that in the picture here. You got um, every opening on the hydrant uh, is connected. Once water supply has been established, the driver operator on the source pumper should open the uncapped discharge or allow water to waste through the dump line until the first relay pumper is ready for water. Here's an example of it in the picture here. The relay pumper will be awaiting water from the source pumper and any other successive pumpers. If it's receiving water in just a few minutes, the relay pumper should have their dump line or extra uncapped discharge valve open. If there's a longer delay, delay that is anticipated, they should not be engaged until they begin to receive water because the pumper may overheat during that delay of several minutes. When both the source pumper and the first relay pumper are ready, the driver operator then slowly opens the discharge supplying the relay hose and closes the dump line valve in a coordinated action. Some jurisdictions allow the relay pumpers driver operators to start a relay by pumping water from the booster tanks through relay hose while waiting for water from the source pumper. This works best on short relays using medium diameter hose. The relay pump operator or operators, depending on if there's more than one relay, should try to maintain the pump intake pressure between 20 and 30 psi, which is 140 and 210 kilopascals. If the intake pressure rises above 50 psi or 350 kilopascals, the relay pump operator should open the dump line valve until residual pressure drops below 50 psi or 350 kilopascals. As the pump operator increases the throttle pump discharge pressure to send water to the next pumper in the line, the dump, valve, dump line valve will have to be gated down to maintain 50 psi or 350 kilopascals residual pressure. If the pressure exceeds 50 psi or 350 kilopascals, friction loss would increase to the point that the pump might go into cavitation. Once water is being discharged by the relay pumper and it has reached the desired pressure, this portion of the relay has been established and no further adjustments should be necessary. When the next relay pumper is ready for water, its driver operator will follow the same procedure. When the water reaches the attack pumper, the operator should bleed out the air from the supply line by opening the bleeder valve on the intake being used. Then open the intake valve on the attack pumper and establish water supply through the relay. An alert operator can open the dump line to allow water to flow. Once the relay is in operation and water is moving, the source and relay pump operators should have minimal work other than monitoring conditions and making adjustments as needed. The pump operators should set automatic pressure control devices to an appropriate level. Adjust the apparatus's auxiliary cooling systems to maintain proper engine operating temperature as well. The adjustable intake pressure relief valves should be set to discharge at 10 psi, which is 70 kilopascals, above the static pressure of the water system to which they are attached, or 
10 PSI above the discharge pressure of the previous pumper in the relay. Continuing with operating the relay, you want to make sure to set the relief pressure so that it should never be higher than the safe working pressure of the hose because otherwise the hose could burst before the relief valve is activated. If an attack pumper is equipped with adjustable intake pressure relief valve, then it needs to be set between 50 and 75 PSI, which is 350 to 525 kilopascals to establish a stable operating condition. If the attack line is shut down or discharge decreases, friction loss in the relay hose decreases and the residual pressure increases, causing the intake pressure relief valve to open. This allows excess water to dump out and the flow through the relay hose to increase and then pressures return to original settings. Never attempt to maintain exact pressures. Changing the pressure at any of the pumpers in a relay operation always has some effect on the other pumpers. Maintaining good system communications during relay pumping operations is absolutely essential because the actions of one unit may affect all others in the relay. Radios are the best means of communication. When there are multiple radio frequencies available, a channel separate from the fire ground channel should be dedicated to coordinating the water supply operation. Relay operations should be shut down in order from the fire scene to the source pumper. If the source pumper is shut down while the rest of the relay is still operating, relay pumpers will run out of water and cavitation can result. So when you're shutting down the relay, starting with the attack pumper, each operator should slowly decrease the throttle and open the dump line, take the pump out of gear, and once all pumpers are shut down, hose may be drained and then readied for reloading. Review questions. First, what should driver operators remember about the relay's maximum capacity when establishing a relay operation? That is on page 452 of the manual. Next question, why is maintaining a good system of communication essential during relay pumping operations? That is page 456 of the text. Next review question, what can be a negative result of the source pumper being shut down while the rest of the relay is still operating? That is also on page 456 of the manual. Class, thank you, as always, for your time and attention. This chapter isn't quite as technical as some of the other chapters, but there is a lot of crucial information here. And if you need any further explanation of any aspect we have covered, make sure to contact your instructor. Again, thank you, and we will meet again for Chapter 15.